trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts with you, and Bill Barley, of course, our historian and storyteller. And today we take a look at a, a really a very unique part of Canada, all in all. It's the only place where the Great American Desert comes up into Canada, and it's in the Oliver Asuyus south of Cost and Karameath area of British Columbia. It's a great spot, you know, and it must be inhospitable, and it must have, all its history must have been inhospitable. Yeah, it's, a, it's a marvelous area, Mike. I, I feel at home in it, and, and, and you know, but in the old days, it was true desert. There's no doubt about it. Annual precipitation, eight and a half inches per year. That's the average. Yeah, very, much. very low. Uh, prickly pear cactus, sagebrush, blue skink, rattlesnakes, uh, scorpions, black widows, everything that came with the desert. And it was indeed inhospitable. And the only people who could really survive in that area, in selected parts of that area, were the Indian nations. And it was a, tr I guess you had to go through the desert uh, because it was through one of the only valleys that allowed you into this area. So trade route was probably, it was something you did in passing. Sure, it was, it was a logical place. It was strategically located, of course. And the Indians, of course, had trails all through this area. And the, and the whites tended to follow the Indian trails. And the first whites, of course, were, were guys like, you know, like David Stewart. These were fur traders who came up from Fort Okanagan. He was accompanied by Montagne in, what, 1811, penetrated into that South Okanagan country, then eventually turned back and went back to, to Fort Okanagan, which is on the U.S. side now. Yeah. They were and just looking for furs at this stage. This was sure exploration they were. for furs. Sure they were. And, but in 1812, and I think that's the key year, Alexander Ross, he penetrated right through the Okanagan Valley, following the Indian trails pretty well, right up to Fort Cameron. And this established a trade route. And that was followed eventually by the brigade, the brigade trains, or the brigades, the fur brigades, mm -hmm. which carried all sorts of supplies from Fort Okanagan right through to Fort Cameron, and eventually right up to Fort St. James. Now right they would carry trade goods in and furs out, that's yeah. the, that's yeah, the usually, function? Yeah, usually that was, the, that was the route. Yeah, and then we talked about this before, but there was the Dudney Trail, and it was established oh, sure. for a little bit later on for uh, really to supply the mining company. Yeah. 1860s, now remember this, that those first trails generally went north and south, with some exceptions. When the horse came in, when the Indians got the horse, they tended to go a little more east and west. But the Dudney Trail was the all-red route. This is to prevent trade from going into the United States. Started really at Fort Hope with the Engineers Road, went right across to the Wild Horse. So it cut across that country. But there were other trails prior to the Dudney. The Chinese Trail was there. They went over the Richter Pass, and they had figured that all out by themselves. And they had picked the right route again. And then, of course, Dudney came along with Moberly, and they followed the same route. And so we had the fur traders coming in first, Mike, and then in the late 1850s and the early 1860s, the placer men came in. Yes, and, and they spent a lot of time, of course, on the Similkameen and Tulameen and, sure they did. and right on through looking for gold. Yeah, they did. And they penetrated, and they checked virtually every creek, Mike. And they were followed by the ranchers. And the ranchers came in, first driving cattle from places like the Oregon, and, uh, and Oregon came up and they drove cattle into, into the Barkerville gold fields and all in through the Caribou itself. And, but these were eventually taken over by the Irishmen. And so the Irishmen, O'Keefe was at Vernon, and another Irishman, Tom Ellis, was at Penticton, and Haynes was at, uh, at the South Okanagan down around the Oliver Suyas area. Now, these Irishmen, although they came from the same background, there was no love lost. And the, I think the, the greatest of the Irishmen there, obviously, was Tom Ellis. He ran about about 20,000 head in that Penticton area. A lot of bottom lands in there, you see. Yeah. So these bottom lands, they, they grew bunch grass there, and he could, he could feed them very well. Um, Haynes didn't do as well. He was on very, very precarious sort of uh, land down there. It was, it was straight desert, with the exception of a bit of bottom land here and there. And eventually he fell into uh, financial difficulties. And who picked up his mortgage? Well, Ellis picked up his mortgage. Eventually he foreclosed on Haynes, whom he knew very well, by the way. Oh, yeah. And it didn't become a blood feud, but the families never forgot it. Even today, the, the ancestors of the original Ellis family and the ancestors of the Haynes family will not talk to each other. So in, th in this environment, inhospitable for more reasons than just the climate, yeah. that we talk about all sorts of things today. We've got miners to talk about. We've got cattlemen to talk about. We'll do that as Gold Trails continues. Don't go away.
Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley, and we're talking about the desert country, and uh, we'll be looking at cattlemen and miners and all sorts of things. I have in my hands uh, one of the great historic artifacts that Bill's got, maps done up by a mining engineer. Now, who was the guy who drew up this map? Well, a guy called Frank Bailey, who was generally known, <laughs> known for me as Stuttering Bailey. Stuttering he, Bailey. Yeah, he had a speech impediment. Very clever man, actually. And his map is really... It, it's precise. He, he got every, virtually every claim that was there in 1900, Mike. This is 1900, and as we take a look at it, this is the, the day, on this day, any of these places would be going. Green Mountain, Black's Camp, Pearson's Camp, Iron Mountain, Camp Uniman. Sure. And it, there they all are, and it shows right where the claims are. Yeah, it was considered surefire country, Mike. It wasn't surefire country. There were parts of it that were great. You, for instance, it mentions here, and it shows Olala. And it, and it, look, it looks like it's yeah. as big as Headley, virtually, and yet, yeah. uh, what happened in Olala? Scores of claims around Olala. Some of the guys there said they wouldn't take $10,000 for their claims. Their claims weren't worth $10 in some instances. Great on the surface, nothing at depth. But when you get into other camps, so Olala was one. There were three camps there. Right. One was Olala. didn't really last. Flash in the pan, Mike. Second one, the second one was Headley, and Headley was a world beater. Headley, for, for years was the leading gold camp in Canada. And that was because of the nickel plate. Yep. And later on, the mascot came into being as well. So Headley became really a bona fide mining town. Olala really didn't last as a mining town. Headley did. Yep. It had, uh, We've got a few artifacts here, and some of these artifacts are just great. Uh, if, you've, if you're a, a, a hotel of any repute, yep. you've got your own china, yep. and uh, the Hotel Similkameen in Headley That's was right. one of those places. Yeah, and it was illustrated. They had about four or five hotels in Headley. And the Hotel Similkameen was, was, was one of the grand hotels in Headley when Headley was a boomer. Yeah, there we got that little piece there. Uh, we, uh, some bottles. Now, these bottles came from Olala. Yeah. Uh, they, these look like uh, pretty impressive things. This is, of course, what everybody wanted to do, it seems yeah. to me, back in the 60s, was find these kinds of bottles. Well, those are quite rare. Red Cross Brewing is, is, uh, is a rare bottle in British Columbia. And quite a, quite a unique bottle, really, and a uh, number were located there. I remember going through just south of Olala and coming across a pile of these bottles. This was 30 years ago, yeah. and there, I just took one or two, and there were hundreds on the pile behind where an old hotel had been, Mike. Now, what would uh, this, I mean, looks like a cannonball, <laughs> but what function does it throw? It does. Okay, that's from a ball mill. It's one of the crushing balls in a ball mill. And some days you had ball mills with two stamps, three stamps, four stamps, five stamps, ten stamps. Headley had uh, a mill with uh, 40 stamps running 24 hours a day, boom, 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 steadily around the clock, crushing that ore to, to be able to, uh, to get the gold out of the... Uh, out of the that uh, must have been a sound that permeated the Similkameen Valley. I mean, uh, I that was the sound of the town's heart. You could hear it as you, as you actually came into Headley. You could hear the, the heavy pounding of the stamp mills. And, you know, it's funny. I talked to people who are, most of them now passed on, but they said once it stopped, when, when Headley stopped manufacturing the, the, the gold and the gold that came out of, out of the nickel plate, they actually missed it. And they'd been there for so many years, they'd become accustomed to it. Well, I can understand that. It's yeah. like when you're at the ocean and suddenly the sound of the waves stop. It's yeah. an eerie moment. Precisely. Well, and of course, once the, the mines were in place, uh, that brought in the railways because they wanted to access the riches yeah. and stuff. And uh, yeah. there's still one bridge, it seems to me, one bridge left of the uh, Great Northern. Well, it's the Great Northern VV&E, which was a Great Northern subsidiary. It was James J. Hill, of course. And the VV&E was a Vancouver, Victoria, and Eastern. And it, it went in to tap those mineral resources in Canada. And they had three of these bridges at one time. And they went right into Headley and ran it for many, many years, actually, until James J. Hill he eventually died in about 1916. So yeah. it wasn't associated with the success of the mine. It was associated, the continued railway was associated with James J.? Oh, yeah, for sure. Genius. Absolute genius. Empire builder. We mentioned him once before. Yeah. Marvelous individual. Really a marvelous individual. So when did Headley get started? It's, it's one of the later ones. Well, 1896 is really the time it starts com coming into its own. And it yeah. carries on intermittently, mostly continuously, till about the 1950s. And it was a hard yeah. rock mine. It, oh, was, yeah. it required uh, tunneling, and uh, it's an open pit now, but it was uh, tunneled then. Sure. Now, it was Fairview is in this area. It's just sort of over the hill near uh, Oliver. Yeah, Fairview. And it was hard rock. Fairview came between these two camps. Olala didn't really amount to much, Mike. Headley did. Fairview went great guns for about four or five years, probably from 1896, 97, Mike, right to just after the turn of the century. 
and uh, really didn't get off the ground. And we have here, we have a very interesting shot that I like. Shows failure, shows a desert country, and shows a very famous Indian, a guy called Long Alex. He's the Indian constable of the area. Indian constable, yeah. is that a common thing? Yeah, he was, uh, well, he was so well-known. Good tracker, good shot, uh, very, very handy with his fists. He, uh, he commanded respect from both whites and Indians and was allowed to arrest both whites and Indians, which is rather unusual. So he wasn't working under somebody. He was on his own as a law enforcement officer. Yes. Yes. Long Alex. Yeah. What was his last name? Did he have I don't know. I can't find it. I know, he I know where he died. He looked like a big guy yeah. on this horse. Unless, unless that's a small horse. No, he was a big man. He was about six feet four inches tall. Yeah, I would command yeah. a little respect. And a uh, very, very fascinating guy. But he wasn't the only Indian that was, yeah. that was fascinating. There was another one called Narcisse Baptiste, who was the uh, chief of the Incanites. And the Incanites were on the east side of Asturias Lake. And up a little draw up in there, what we call Old Incanite now. And they're a branch of the Okanagan Nation. But they are kind of unique to themselves. And, um, and the chief, Baptiste, was an interesting guy. He, he was the chief of the tribe for about 30-odd years, mate. And so right on early in, the, early in the century, right into the 1940s. And rather interesting story, because first of all, you have to look at the man. Now, you know, when you look down at that country, you see the Baptiste and the Georges and the Selkias and, and a number of other, uh, uh, and the Louis and a number of other Indian families that are very prominent down there. But he was one of the most prominent of all the Incanese. He was a wealthy cattleman, very wealthy indeed, and um, ran hundreds and hundreds of cattle. Up in that up in that high country, which was ideal for cattle, yeah. had a number of creeks penetrating it, and um, ruled the reserve with an iron hand. What chief what chief Baptiste said was the law, and that is not an exaggeration. You talk to Indians who are well advanced in age down there, and they will agree with this perception of this particular chief. And he was um, a shrewd businessman. Invested, and that this is a rather interesting story. He invested in Canadian government bonds, which I think were a good buy then. And, um, but somewhere along the route in the early 1940s, he had many bonds, and some of these were in $1,000 denominations, and he evidently cashed them in. And it's a very difficult story to follow because I get two or three different variations from the various Indians I talk with. But according to the majority of them, he cashed the bonds in and turned them into either gold coin yeah. or, or bullion gold, and we don't know which. And the story is rather interesting because Again, the variations come into, into play. And according to the majority of the Indians, he buried the gold, which he'd received from the bonds, and he was, well, he was an old man by then, within sight of the old Roman Catholic Church. Now, that's in the upper reserve. There are two Catholic churches, one is much later. One goes back to about the 1880s, and it's, uh, the old cemetery is right behind it. So, and the Indians are, most of the Indians are quite convinced that this actually did happen. He turned it into gold, and um, the gold, of course, <laughs> is, is so always he, nice, because that's the kind of coin he would have got. Double eagles, eagles, uh, five-dollar gold pieces, and so on. And he buried it within sight of the Catholic, I'm, I'm paying close attention yeah. here, of the old Roman Catholic Church, yeah. where? Down, down in the Inconeep area? Up in the Inconeep, up behind, in the old, old village, where the old village is. And of course, you're not allowed in there. In the Indians, that's Indian land so that the average individual is, is not allowed in there, and that's, that's rightly so. And um, Any assessment of how much gold might be buried there? I think thousands and thousands at face value at that time. And of course, these coins now, well, that was worth $20, worth about four or 500 now, depending upon the date and, and, and where it was minted and so on. So um, quite a significant treasure. Interesting story. What an interesting story. Yeah. And when we talk about these other ranchers there, you mentioned Ellis, you mentioned Haynes. Yeah. These people wielded big power. Oh. They were the... Well, the, the way it went, they were the ones who determined what happened in this country. Ellis, Ellis uh, was considered the richest man in the Okanagan Valley by far. You know, as I say, he ran about 20,000 head. He virtually controlled Penticton until they eventually divided it up to go into orchards and so on. And that was after the water was, was brought in. And irrigation. he probably had a hand in doing that, too. Was oh, he yeah, involved sure he in sure. every aspect yeah. of this? He was a baron, a cattle baron, oh, sure would you was. say so? Oh, most, most definitely. His daughter, one of his daughters, mar married Patty Burns, who was the meatpacking guy. So it was a unification of two great families, really. I mean, he produced the cattle and Burns packed them. Sure, sure. And Haynes, who you alluded to at the beginning, yeah. uh, Haynes Point's named after, and he was yeah. a judge, was he not? Yes, he was. Yeah. And, and he lost his ranch to Ellis, and that must have 
I mean, why? I mean, we were a more peaceful people in this country, but that could have uh, arranged a, a range war somehow. Yeah, well, in parts of the United States, it did. In Canada, it tended not to. And um, you do still have hard, hard feelings, as I said, between the two families. And this goes back over a century, Mark. This is 130 years ago. And when we, th I take a look at some pictures, rodeos, uh, I mean, uh, cattle drives and stampedes sure. and things like that were all part of it. And Xavier Richter, of course, a name yeah. that comes out of there. And you always see him riding a horse at top speed. These yeah. guys were good, a question. Yeah, and the Indians uh, were probably better than they were. I mean, some of the Indian riders were, they say, the best light horsemen in the world. They could mount on the dead run and, uh, and uh, stay on a horse when nobody else would stay on a horse. And, uh, of course, some of the great rodeo riders were Indian. Uh, the McLeans are an example. Well, what a wonderful story. Has it ever been totally chronicled? I mean, have we uh, done a good job on, on bringing to the, everybody's attention this remarkable component of our history? No, I don't think so. I mean, you, you touch on the Cougars and you touch on the McLeans, and, and I think an Indian scholar will probably concentrate on that, come up with a marvelous story. It would indeed. Well, when you see the Olmec stampede right now, most of the riders that come down the suicide uh, hill race are uh, Indian riders to this day. That's true, but the old the Olmec stampede doesn't compare to the old Kelowna stampede when it came down off Knox Mountain. Uh, I believe that two riders were killed in three years on that. I was there, and that was in the in the ninth, mid mid 1940s, and it was it was incredibly brutal race. And and who won it every time you came into it virtually was with Billy Kruger. Who? When did this era end? When did the cattleman's era end down south, or is it still going? Well, there's still cattlemen. I have. Uh, now, there are about 200 cattlemen in the, in the Smilkameen, in the Boundary, in the South Okanagan. Mm -hmm. so, still some cattlemen. But when did their era end? About I the 20s? The just yeah. prior to... The great Earth part War? of the era really ended about 1915. Fascinating. Going to take a break here, but be back in just a second. There are lots of other stories to tell, and we've just got a great story, uh, and we'll do that right after this break. <laughs> artifact from your collection, a yeah. uh, 44, which is a pretty standard caliber. Yeah. Uh, pump, I have not encountered an old pump before, but a, uh, a gun that's not a Remington and not a Winchester. No, Colt Mike, 1883, over 100 years old. Simpson family and relatives of the Simpsons came into the Okanagan. This gun came in, came in around the late 1880s, essentially a rancher's gun. Yeah. And uh, didn't catch on like the Winchester. Pretty, pretty, yeah, pretty rare yeah. breed because everybody owned a Winchester, but not many people owned one of these. No, Winchester was was well used all through the Pacific Slope. I mean, three out of four people had a Winchester as far in, in that country, certainly. And that reminds me, you know, of um, of a story that I, I think is worth relating. I, I've tried to trace this story for about 35 or 36 years, so I've been at it for a little while, Mike, and have not been successful in some respects. But certainly the story is worth relating, and every time I've asked one, and it's again, a, it's a story about an Indian hunter, and uh, sometimes called the Lost Galena Mine, sometimes called the Lost Indian Mine, and uh, started in Penticton, which is just, just north of that desert country, but not very far north. Shingle Creek Reserve, 1897 or 1898, Mike. Yeah. One of the Indian hunters, and the, the name Pierre keeps on cropping up, so it's probably one of the Pierre family. And he started out hunting, usual fall trip, late fall, went along the old Brigade Trail. So he started from Shingle Creek and went south along the Brigade Trail. Now, he was heading into essentially mining country, Mike. In that south country, you have the Grand Door District, you have the Utica area, and a lot of gold and silver properties in that area, some of them extremely rich. Where would this be in relation to Tween Lakes or the Marin Valley? I mean, would it be going right through this yeah, country? Yeah, you, you'd have to cut through the Marin Valley, which yep. is another French name, Wild Horse, this yep. means. You cut through the Marin Valley, and then you go up over the top and down into that Twin Lakes and then into the Grand Door, and eventually you go down to Utica. Now, Utica, for instance, was the old Horn Silver Mine. Yep. That eventually produced, what, several million ounces of silver. And in that Grand Door country, there was very, very rich surface deposits. So this is silver and gold country. But he wasn't concerned about silver and gold. He started out to get a deer. And he went down, we don't know how far he went down, but he was along the Brigade Trail. And somewhere along that trail, he branched off. Now, this is interesting country because every draw looks about the same, Mike. They're lightly treed, and at that time, there would probably be some bunch grass and some sagebrush and so on. And uh, so he branched off looking for deer and, and uh, didn't, was not successful. He was a good hunter, but was not successful. And he looked and looked, and eventually, late fall, darkness came in, 
and the gloom got him, and he said, well, I better, I better bed down for the night. And what he did is he, uh, like any good Indian hunter, he uh, got some fur boughs, made himself a nice, comfortable fur, bo fur bow bed, and then he looked around, and he was going to have a fire because it was pretty cool, and uh, grabbed some, some rocks that were in the immediate area. Mm -hmm. and you could see these in the gathering gloom, and put these rocks around his fire, you know, for safety precaution, lit the fire, stayed close to the fire all night, got up in the morning, feeling fairly refreshed, looked at the fire, yeah. now he had daylight, and this is what he saw. Got, these were the rocks that formed the ring of his, of his campfire. Yeah, he had noticed the night before that they were kind of heavy, but he thought because he was tired, but when he looked at them, it was Galena. Now, he was not a, he was not a load miner, Mike, and he wasn't a prospector. But he but knew it, something. That's right. It, it <laughs> kind of, it sparked his interest, so he took three pieces of it, and there were lots of it all around this area, in the immediate vicinity. Yeah. This is what we call float. So he put three pieces in his pack, rolled back to Shingle Creek, and just kind of the off chance, he put the three pieces <laughs> on, on the sill of uh, one of the windows. And they stayed there for two or three years. And um, he didn't think any more about it, but left them there. One day, uh, a white man from Penticton came in, who's a prospector. Three different names come up, so I can't, I don't know which one it was. And he, he looked at this and he says, oh, he says, that's good cleaner. Where'd you get that? Oh, he says, just down on the, down the old brigade trail just off the trail. Yeah. And the guy, of course, is, is fascinated Wee! with this, right? He's vibrating That's now. Right, sure he is. We got gold, <laughs> we yeah. got silver ahead of us. That's right. So he figures, okay, let's, uh, let's go and take a look for it. So the Indian figures he can, he can go back to the spot. Well, they go down the Brigade Trail and heading south. They tried a dozen different places the first day, which he thought he might have. Now your mind plays you false sometimes mm -hmm. after two or three years. And he was not successful. But they went back again the next week, and they went back again the next week, they hunted for that particular spot literally for years where they both lived. And they were never successful. And this isn't part of what became the Utica mine or it was mined Definitely, by somebody else? No, it wasn't as far south as the Utica. I think it was somewhere in that Grand Door Twin Lakes region. That's where I think. And that is that is rather fascinating area. And that's gold and silver country. So I believe that, that, that the so-called lost Indian mine uh, has not been discovered. And um, it wasn't Utica, and it wasn't as far south as Fairview, but it was in that general area. Another one. So we might have buried gold near the Incomeat Reserve, which is on mm -hmm. uh, Indian Reserve land, and we might have just a, the mother load of silver just in that area around uh, Tween Lakes and the uh, White Lake Observatory. Oh, who knows this kind of stuff? But what you really have, Mike, is you have, I think, some of the finest country you can walk through. I mean, you go down through that South Similkameen country, and you go down through the... That, that desert country right down towards Speaking Rock and then the American side or the Canadian side, and you have marvelous desert country still. And wonderful stories. Gosh, the cattle ranching component, the fur brigade component, placer miners, hard rock miners, and it's still there, a lot of it for you to see. And that's Gold Trails for today. Thanks for joining us. Back again next time. We'll see you then.